Rejecting the reality of Israel's rebirth as a nation is a dangerous trend of false theology in today's progressive churches. The Jewish state's resurrection in 1948 is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, but many churches have fallen into apostasy, perfectly fulfilling the words of the prophets about the days in which we're living. As predicted in the New Testament for these last days, increasingly the church is abandoning this word of God as the standard of truth. This despite the fact that a century ago, precise prophecies in the book of Daniel identified the exact timing of Messiah's first coming. Just as most of the world missed the Lord's first coming, now even the church, for the most part, is not ready for the Lord's second coming. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. The great falling away or apostasy predicted by the New Testament is especially evident in America, in Britain, and Europe, in nations that once stood for biblical values, but are now actually warring against biblical family values. As Western culture increasingly promotes sin and perversions, we're also witnessing, as a consequence, growing hostility to the gospel. The so-called cancel culture has, as its number one agenda, canceling the Bible and the voices of God's people. It's not as if God didn't warn us. Recently, an organization called the Joshua Fund commissioned a survey that asked respondents to answer some very specific questions about current events. And surprisingly, it turns out that a substantial portion of the population actually believes that events happening in the world today are directly related to Bible prophecy. Even though the percentage of Americans that identify as Christians has been steadily declining for many years, still 40% of Americans said that they believe that we're living in the period of wars and rumors of wars described as signs of the times by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. According to the survey, 40% of Americans agreed that the COVID pandemic is a sign of biblical prophecy coming to pass and that it's a harbinger of the last days. So there you have it. At least 40% of the U.S. population believes that these are the end times. And even though such a high percentage believe that we're living in the last days, Another survey has found that the American people are unfortunately less engaged with the Bible than ever before. And that means the population is increasingly biblically illiterate. And that's a huge mistake because the times ahead of us are going to be extremely challenging and we're going to need God more than ever. Global events continue to move in ways that we have been anticipating for a very long time. According to an article in Prophecy News Watch, we are far closer to a potential global crisis than most people would dare to imagine. In fact, the world is very fragile and things could collapse, like the proverbial house of cards. Leaders from all across the political spectrum are openly warning us of a worldwide food crisis. But when people in the Western world hear of such warnings, most tend to assume that the shortages will only affect the poor people in Africa or Asia. Unfortunately, predictions are that the entire world is truly approaching an unprecedented time of danger in the food chain. Global hunger 
had already been steadily rising for the past couple of years due to the COVID pandemic. And now a confluence of events threatens to create a true global nightmare. We're still eating food that was previously grown, but it is the food that will not be grown in the months ahead that will be the real problem. Experts say we don't have much of a buffer to work with. Now more than ever before, it's essential that believers know what the Bible teaches about the end times. We don't know when the rapture, the catching away of believers by the Lord is going to happen. But we know from turmoil in Israel that the period in the Bible known as the Great Tribulation, Jacob's trouble, could be just around the corner. We see the convergence of so many prophecies happening right now. Israel is facing a critical time of danger on many fronts, militarily, diplomatically, and politically. With nuclear talks in Iran, riots on the Temple Mount, terror attacks, and an unstable political atmosphere, Israel just seems to be more vulnerable than ever. We should have understood the times because the Bible has not left us in the dark concerning the end of the church age. And at least two notable books were published on Daniel's prophecy of Israel's 70 weeks and the timing of Messiah's first coming, all predicted in Daniel chapter 9. The first well-known book on the subject was called The Coming Prince, written by Sir Robert Anderson and published in 1895. The second book on Daniel's 70 weeks was called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ by Harold Holner. The calculations denoted by both men are similar, and they both pinpointed the time of Jesus' ministry in death as fulfillments of Daniel's specific prophecies. You see, Bible chronology is so exacting that nobody else in history could be the Jewish Messiah but Jesus of Nazareth. The significance of Sir Robert Anderson's book, The Coming Prince, should be recognized by our current generation of Bible prophecy students. In his day, Anderson defended the prophet Daniel's authorship of the book of Daniel, despite the negative climate of biblical interpretation known as higher criticism. And Anderson also established from Daniel chapter 9 the timing of the first coming of Jesus on the Sunday before Passover. He calculated that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the 6th of April, in the year of our Lord, 32. If God gave us the chronology of the Lord's first coming in the Bible, many eschatologists believe that God is also willing for believers to study and anticipate the Lord's second coming. And according to 1 Peter 1.12, even the angels desire to look into these matters concerning our salvation. Now, let's look at Daniel chapter 9, and, and verse 25 begins, Know and understand. In other words, you've got to have a skilled spiritual mind. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, it uses the word Messiah comes. In a nutshell, the angel Gabriel told Daniel that the Jewish Messiah would come 490 biblical years after the commandment of Cyrus, king of Persia, to rebuild and restore Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile of the Jews. Anderson's calculations based on the biblical year of 360 days concluded that Jesus rode into Jerusalem to public acclaim, the day known as his triumphant entry, on the precise day that was prophesied by the book of Daniel. After all, Daniel was told by the angel Gabriel details concerning the return of the Jews to their own land, as well as the first advent of Messiah and the purpose for his coming to die to make atonement. Well, the Jewish people of Jesus' day should have known the Daniel prophecy 
and they should have anticipated the timing of Messiah's appearing. And that's why Jesus lamented that the Jewish leadership missed the time of his visitation. Why? They simply could not recognize the chronology of the passage in the book of Daniel. And therefore, because of their spiritual stupor, the Lord wept over Jerusalem. Think about that. At first, only a handful of people recognized the timing of the Lord's first coming. The shepherds in Bethlehem, the wise men from the east, a prophet in the Jewish temple named Simeon. He's found in Luke chapter 2. And also a prophetess named Anna recognized it. That was so few. That's why, according to Luke chapter 19, verse 41, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if only you had known on this day the things that would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. They couldn't discern the signs of the times. They disbelieved Jesus as Messiah and willfully rejected him. He wept because he was moved with compassion over the coming destruction of the city that was surely going to happen. And he also wept because of the stubborn foolishness of his own people arrayed against him. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that killed the prophets and stoned God's messengers, he cried. How often I've wanted to gather you to myself as a hen gathers her chicks but you were unwilling. Earlier in Matthew 16, 3, Jesus also rebuked his people because they didn't know the chronology of Messiah. In the morning you say, there will be a storm today because the sky is red. Jesus said, you know how to observe the appearance of the sky, but you do not know how to discern the signs of this time. Indeed, they could have discerned the times of Messiah simply by studying and calculating the prophecy, knowing and understanding the book of Daniel outlining Messiah's first coming. They should have been anticipating and welcoming him according to the timeline given by the angel Gabriel in the book of Daniel. The leadership should have known and should have been preparing the people and watching for him when Jesus came and made his claims confirm by many messianic miracles that he performed. Blind eyes opening, the lepers cleansed, the lame and the paralyzed restored to health, even the dead raised to life. But to them, that didn't matter. His identity was refused when it should have been unmistakable. Well, one of Anderson's contemporaries wrote that Sir Robert Anderson is one of the men to whom the country, without knowing it, owes a great debt. He was born into a home of Irish Presbyterians in Dublin in 1841. And Anderson eventually became a theologian and an intelligence officer with Scotland Yard, for which he was knighted by Queen Victoria. The preacher and hymn writer Horatius Bonnard first taught Sir Robert the precious truths concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus and set him on a quest concerning Bible prophecy in general, both the Lord's first and second comings. And Hebrews 9.28 became precious to Anderson. That verse proclaims, So Messiah was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Anderson's coming prince was so prophetic that it was written many years before the Balfour Declaration of 1917, in which Britain guaranteed a Jewish national home in the land of Israel. Britain thus established the modern framework for Israel to be rebirthed as a nation in 1948, The Balfour Declaration also set the stage for the new nation of Israel to become the platform for a third temple to be built. But according to Daniel 9.27, this temple of God will be desecrated by another prince that shall come, referring to the Antichrist, who according to the prophecy 
is going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's Bible code language for seven years. And the prophecy says in the midst of the week, in other words, after three and a half years, the Antichrist will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object of some sort that will desecrate the holy place until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So the churches should be well familiar with these prophecies and should be teaching them instead of ignoring Bible prophecy and thus misleading the people. In the conclusion of The Coming Prince, Sir Robert wrote that it was a calamity for the Church of God when the light of prophecy became dimmed in fruitless controversy. The irony is that today, Bible prophecy is more controversial than ever. And many preachers scoff and scorn the topic and won't even touch Bible prophecy, or they denounce it as toxic, and they frequently denounce the scriptural doctrine of the rapture. Sir Robert Anderson's zeal, on the other hand, should encourage us to pursue the words of our Lord's prophecy in Revelation 1.3. It says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it. Why? It says, because the time is near. What time? The time is near when all these things will happen, including the second coming. Just when the church should be on its spiritual toes watching for the Lord's appearing, tragically instead, the spirit of Antichrist is rampant. In fact, not long after Jesus arose from the dead, the spirit of the Antichrist was already permeating the world and dominating, unfortunately, the institutional church during the dark ages and onward. To incorporate so many pagans as possible, pagan holidays were given a Christian spin and were adopted into the church. Yet, believers are commanded by the Bible to separate ourselves from the world and not to merge with it. From the beginning, the Apostle John warned the church that the spirit of the Antichrist was already operational in the world. And throughout its history, the institutional church has persecuted believers, those who possessed a copy of the scriptures. It's estimated that over 50 million believers who refused to join the so-called mother church have been martyred. The Apostle John wrote, Little children... It is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know it is the last hour. Meanwhile, in our lifetime, more prophecies have been fulfilled than any other generation since the time of Jesus' first coming on earth. Fast forward to our generation, and since the Holocaust and Israel's miraculous rebirth in 1948, the Jewish people have continued to fight for their lives and a great battle lies ahead in the near future. We see events shaping up towards it now when Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 predict that a leader mysteriously called Gog, G-O-G, from the land of Magog will invade the mountains of Israel and cover the land like a cloud. Who is this Gog And what is Magog? And when will this invasion occur? Well, Gog is identified as a prince of Rosh, associated with a land called Magog, whose stated location is in the remote parts of the north. That's according to Ezekiel 38, 15. And north means north of Israel, because Israel is the geographic center of the biblical text. The fact that Magog is in the far north identifies it as the area of the former Soviet Union, or plainly today Russia. The Jewish historian Josephus as well identified Magog as the land of the Scythians, an area now occupied by the aggressive Russian bear. In Ezekiel 38, God says to the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, And prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you 
and I am going to put hooks in your jaws. And verse 8 of that chapter says, after many days, you will be called to arms. In future years, you will invade the land that was recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. But they, the Jewish people, had been brought out from the nations, and now all of them live in safety, it says. Furthermore, this chapter enumerates other nations in a confederation against Israel in this future attack, represented by lands from the region known today as Russia, as well as a number of Islamic nations, including Persia. That's pinpointed in verse 5, which, of course, is modern-day Iran, Israel's mortal enemy. Furthermore, according to Ezekiel 38, verse 11, the invasion will occur when Israel is at rest and experiencing peace and security in a land of unwalled villages. Many Bible scholars identify this period of security as Israel's future time of a false peace, which will be made in league with the Antichrist, according to the peace covenant predicted in Daniel 9, 27. But the invaders are destined to fail. They will fail to calculate that they will actually come up against the God of Israel himself. They're ignorant of God's word, which is plainly laid out here in the Bible in the book of Ezekiel. God says he will break the power of Israel's enemies and they will die and burn. In Ezekiel 39, God says, I'm against you, O God. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and your hordes. And he says, I'm going to give you unto the ravenous birds and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. And I will send fire on Magog. It will be the God of Israel, not the United States or any other nation that will save Israel. This defeat will be so complete that the house of Israel will bury their enemies for seven months in order to cleanse the land. Even at this point in time, ever since 2017, the Israeli military has reported that it's carried out more than 400 airstrikes in Syria and other parts of the Middle East as part of a wide-ranging campaign targeting Iran and its allies. But things are heating up. And by the way, Bible prophecy students should note that there is a final reference to Gog and Magog in the book of Revelation. When the future literal reign of King Jesus on earth comes to its close, after a thousand years of peace on earth, Satan will be freed from his prison and he will be allowed once again to test the hearts of men. And he will amass an army that's referred to as Gog and Magog, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, according to Revelation 28. This time, scholars say Gog and Magog come to attack from everywhere, not just from the north. So in this instance, Gog and Magog appear to be a type of rebels, representing all souls who will live during the millennium, yet who exercise their free will by deciding upon mutiny against Jesus as their king. Clearly, Bible prophecy should be studied so that events don't take us by surprise and so that we are not fallen into unbelief and rebellion. Paul the Apostle exhorted us in the second chapter of Titus, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Doing what? Looking, he said, for the blessed hope, and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus, the Messiah. That verse speaks of the Lord's appearing when he comes for us in the atmosphere at the rapture. It's not referring to his second coming to earth to rule from Jerusalem. And as we acknowledge all the global, political, and spiritual developments around the world, today I want to thank the Lord for this blessed hope of the Lord's sudden appearing. I thank God that the Lord is coming to save us. We see coming to pass everything that the Lord spoke to the prophets a long time ago. 
and we see a great convergence of the signs of the end times. Yet the Lord has waited nearly 2,000 years because he is long-suffering. He's not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance and to the knowledge of the Savior, Jesus. We want to be ready. Let's be watchful. Let's be sober. Let's care about souls who are perishing. I received an email recently from a friend who said she was musing over a seminar she had attended during the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem on the subject of biblical economics. And she was recalling what the speaker had pinpointed in Revelation chapter 18. Let's turn to that passage and pick up with verse 11, where it says, The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all kinds of wood and ivory and manners of vessels most precious of brass, marble and iron so forth and cinnamon and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil. Flour and wheat, beasts, sheep, and horses and chariots, and finally it lifts at last, and slaves and the souls of men. This is ironical in this list because the bodies and souls of people seem to be the least valuable listed last, when, of course, to God in eternity, souls are the most valuable commodity. Well, because time is so short, I want to challenge you also to dare to say with me what the Bible declares, that you and I are sinners in need of the world's only Savior who came, as Daniel chapter 9 declares, to die on our behalf and to make an end of sin for us. And if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and if you're willing to confess through the mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Bible declares, you shall be saved. Amen. Well, if you have any comments or questions today, you can contact me through social media and through our website, exploits.tv. And don't forget, download our free Jerusalem Channel app to access our entire video library. We also offer many ebooks available on our website on a variety of important subjects, including this one entitled, All Eyes Riveted on the Temple Mount. That covers a lot of what we have discussed in this program today. So until our next time together, I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dark. Shalom and Maranatha.